Just a few short days ago, <clears throat> many of you gathered around a Christmas tree or a living room setting, and you opened up gifts. And maybe this year you can say you had greater gifts than you have ever gotten in your life before. Or some of you might say this year was not the best gifts. Eh, it's okay. I came across a list, and these are some of the top gifts given for the year 2020. So let's see if maybe any of you got some of these. Gift number one, apparently this is really popular this year. This is a reusable straw with its own carrying container. So for those of you who just really love to use a straw and you are suspicious about the ones covered in paper and you don't know what happened to them before they came to your table, you can have your own straw, take it with you from place to place. You'll never be without a straw again. Personally, this has no appeal to me whatsoever. I am totally fine with a throwaway straw. But if this is you, I hope that you get one of these very soon. Number two, now this might have interest in my life. This is called the beard bib. So you hook it around your neck, you stick it on the mirror, then as you trim your beard, all the hair falls down in there, take it outside, throw it in the yard, put it in the trash can. That way you don't get hair all over the sink. This may be as much a gift for wives and moms as it is for husbands because hair gets everywhere. So this is okay. I'm in on this one. Number three, this is for those who want to make a special memory. And so I remember as a kid, we had these viewfinders and we'd see things like E.T. and, you know, G.I. Joe's. Well, now you can have these custom made, and so you send in what photos you want to be put into the wheel, and then you give to somebody to look inside, and it could be your first date, it could be Christmas Day, anything you want, you put the images in there. So that's a pretty neat gift, something would definitely be memorable. For the dinosaur lover in your family, these are 3D light stands that set up beside your nightstand at nighttime. It can be a, a glow in the dark. It can be something that you keep on or just something fun to look at, but they change colors. This is a really popular gift this year. For that person in your family who always goes back to the microwave about every minute or two to heat their coffee up because they like it to be so hot that it burns their taste buds off, this is a temperature-regulating coffee cup. So you set it to what temperature you want it to be, and it will keep it at that temperature at a constant level. So for some of you are going, this is the greatest thing I have ever seen. Finally, this is what they call the meat claws. So if you are somebody who likes to cook a whole bunch of pork butts and briskets and then shred them up, and you're tired of having to use forks, these are the meat claws that you can use to shred that up into pulled pork or into brisket, and or they also double as back scratchers. And in an emergency situation, personal protection devices. <laughs> so these are some gifts we might say would be really good, or you may say these gifts are not so good at all. This morning, we are going to conclude our Christmas series called The Wonder of Christmas, and we're going to look at the three gifts brought to Jesus by the Magi, and we want to see what do those gifts tell us about who Jesus is and what do they mean for us today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 2. Our words are always on our screen up here. If you don't have a Bible of your own, you would like one, please take one of those Bibles from our pews and put your name in it, and that's our gift to you today. Matthew chapter 2, three things we learn about these three gifts. Number one, we see it is a, that he received a gift of worthiness. There are two types of people in this room, two types of people watching from home when it comes to Christmas music. So Pastor Glenn said this morning, I love Christmas songs. And there are some of you that feel that same exact way. So on the day after Thanksgiving, when the radio stations start playing Christmas songs, you go, this is what I've been waiting for all year long. But then there's the other side and the other group of people who, when that first Christmas song comes on after Thanksgiving on the radio or in the grocery store, you say to yourself, and so it begins. And it's like a bah humbug moment because you don't want to listen to those songs. But if you love Christmas songs, you like to sing Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and I Want a Hippopotamus for Christmas. One of my favorite songs for Christmas time is The 12 Days of Christmas. 
And I think it brings back memories for me of seeing different people seeing all the different parts and have visuals, and it makes for funny videos. Years ago, I read that from the 1550s until about 1829, Roman Catholics in England were unable to worship in public. And so someone wrote the 12 Days of Christmas as a song that was a worship montage that could be hidden and nobody knew what the words were speaking of. Now, I don't know this to be absolutely true, but I read it on the internet, so it must be at least 99.9% true. But it said, here's what all these things represent. The partridge in a pear tree, there's only one, right? So that's Jesus Christ, our Savior. The two turtle doves, the Old and New Testament. The three French hens, faith, hope, and love. The four calling birds, well, there's four gospels. The five golden rings would be the first five books of the Old Testament known as the Torah. The six geese laying, that's the six days of creation. The seven swans of swimming are the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. The eight maids of milking are the eight beatitudes. The nine ladies dancing, there's nine fruits of the Spirit. Ten lords of leaping, there's ten commandments. The 11 pipers piping, the 11 faithful disciples, and then the 12 drummers drumming are the 12 points of belief in the Apostles' Creed. And so this may or may not be true, but if it is, how neat that you can sing this song about the partridge and the drummers and all these different people, and it's just a song in itself, but then if you know there's a deeper meaning behind it, it's even more special. All three of the gifts that we see given to Jesus today, they have value in themselves, but they all have a deeper meaning for us as to what the Magi were saying about this babe, Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When you see a picture of the manger scene, often this is what you see included. You have a beautiful, perfect little stable scene. Of course, a star. There's an angel there, Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, and the little crib. You have a couple of animals, donkey, sheep, maybe the shepherds on one side, and then the wise men on the other side. We don't know this is exactly what the scene looked like. From these passages, it just says that the wise men came from the east after Jesus was born. So some will say that was maybe pretty soon or even up to two years later. But when they came, it says that they wanted to find this king who was born, the one who had been prophesied. So they go to King Herod, and they say, hey, Herod, where's the king at? And I'm sure Herod was like, I'm right here. I'm the king. And they go, no, 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 the king who was born, the king of the Jews. And they were following a star. And this week we had a pretty momentous occasion. If you are an astrologer or a study of the skies, there was the Christmas star. And I didn't get to see it personally, but I saw some pictures. And it looked something like this here. So it was a perfect culmination when the planets Jupiter and Saturn lined up on the horizon to where it looked like one big, huge mega star in the sky. And many people were outside looking at this star this week or looking for it. And maybe it was a bright star like that, or maybe even bigger and even brighter that the wise men were following. And I can see them going into King Herod, and they have these bags, and they have these satchels. And Herod was probably thinking, oh, look, they brought gifts. And he goes, what did you bring me? And maybe they said, well, we didn't bring anything for you. Instead, we brought gifts for the king, the King Jesus. There's a big difference between King Jesus and King Herod. S.M. Lockridge, he wrote a sermon, and it was called, That's My King. And he says, here's the difference between Jesus and other kings. My king was born king. The Bible says he's a seven-way king. He's the king of the Jews. That's an ethnic king. He's the king of Israel. That's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Now that's my king. He is a king of knowledge. He is the wellspring of wisdom. He is the doorway of deliverance, the pathway of peace, the roadway of righteousness, the highway of holiness, the gateway of glory. He is the master of the mighty, the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes, the leader of the legislators. He is the overseer of the overcomers. 
He is the governor of the governors, the prince of princes. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Now that is my king. What a great difference that we see between a king on this earth and a king who has a heavenly reign and comes down to us. So one of the gifts that the Magi brought to him was gold. In our world, we see gold often, necklaces and bracelets and rings. There's even gold-plated phone covers and different things in the world. You didn't see gold very often in this day and time because it was so valuable and the people were so poor that gold was only a gift given to a king. And so here's what that says for us. Gold was their best. And so when we think about the gifts that we give to those that we love, we think about gifts that we have received, we often want to give our very best to others. And I've seen you and I myself have given their best in lots of areas in their lives. I've seen your post at 4.30 on Monday morning from the CrossFit gym where you are soaking wet and exhausted because you gave your best working out. I've seen you try to go after that promotion at work and give your very best to your employer. I've seen you in your home or at school or on the football field giving your very best. But how often do we only give God maybe our kind of good or our almost okay or just our average or even a little bit less than that? How often do we not give God our absolute very best in our service, in our time, in our worship, in our sacrifice. See, they gave gold to him because it was their best and because he was their king. We don't see kings very often in our world today, but when I think about a king, I think about a movie with big iron shields and swords and round tables and knights and chain link metal. And the word king itself to me brings up three words, submission, allegiance, and service. That's the way that you respond to a king. Is that the same way that you treat Jesus? Because we often refer to him as our Savior or as our Lord, or even as our friend, as our hope. But do you live as though he is your king? Do you live in submission and allegiance and in service? The Magi also brought Jesus a gift for worship. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly. He ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And had sent to them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring word to me that I too may come and worship him. In this moment, King Herod is feeling threatened. He's feeling overwhelmed because he's the king. And the mention of any other king would mean that he would no longer be in control or in charge. So he brings in the wise men quietly and says, Well, please go and find this baby, this king of the Jews. Because I want to know exactly where he's at because I too want to worship him, and he had bad intentions the whole time. See, Herod's greatest fear in this moment was that if there was another king, then that means that his reign would be over. And Herod didn't want that to happen. He wanted to reign forevermore and evermore and evermore. And so this baby Jesus was a threat to his throne because then he would no longer be in control. And I wonder if maybe that's how some of us feel when we think about making Jesus the king of our life. Lord, I know that you're good and I know that you love me, but I'm a little bit concerned because I like to reign over my own territory. And I like to be in the throne of my house. And Lord, I want to be royalty when it comes to what I want to do, when I want to do, and how I want to do it. And I don't know that I want anyone else to be in control because I got plans, Lord, and they're really good plans that you should absolutely listen to and that you should follow and so Herod has all these worries and these fears that sometimes we have because we too like to be in control and we too like to have a plan. But to make Jesus our king, that means that we follow him instead of ourselves. Verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before 
then went into the rest, went until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and they worshipped him. Then opening the treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense. It says they walked into the house. This is good evidence to us that they're no longer in that manger scene where Jesus was born, but they moved somewhere more comfortable. And it says they brought the gift of gold because he was their king, and they brought the gift of incense. Incense is a very different odor. It's not something that you smell very often. If you've been to have a massage or maybe went into a herbal supply place, you may smell incense that is burning there. In this day and age, incense was burned as a fragrance of worship. So they would burn incense in the temple, and it would be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And so if you ask the question, what is it exactly that a baby or an infant would do with incense, the answer is this, nothing. There's nothing that a baby would be able to do with incense. It wasn't for his skin. It wasn't for diaper rash. They brought incense because this was not only the king of kings. This was also God's son, and he was holy and to be worshipped. Remember verse 2. For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. So usually when somebody comes to see a baby, it's customary they bring a gift and then when they see this young infant they want to sing a song to him and make him happy so maybe the prequel was sung here because baby sharks are really popular song in our world maybe back then they came in and they sang baby camel 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 baby or maybe they came in and said we just want to play with him and we want to play pee pie and we want to make him excited no it says these grown men who were royal and righteous and they were wise scholars of the stars they fell down and they bowed and worshiped this young infant child because he was not just a baby he was God's son there's a song i heard years ago called how many kings and it talks about this picture and it says they would follow the star to a place unexpected. If you were to expect a new king, you would expect gold and thrones and royalty and big, huge castles and things like this. But instead, this is a poor child in a poor environment. Would you believe, after all, they've projected a child in a manger, lowly and small, the weakest of all, unlikely as heroes, wrapped in his mother's shawl, just a child. Is this who we've waited for? But how many kings step down from their thrones? And how many lords have abandoned their homes? And how many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? And how many fathers gave up their sons for me? There's only one who did that for me. I don't know where you're at in your faith journey today. But maybe you can identify with the Magi and you're seeking something. They were looking for a king and they were looking for the Savior. And maybe for some reason you can't see that bright star that leads you to him. And you keep getting distracted. You keep getting off course. And I pray that you would do your very best to search and to find him more than you ever have before. Or maybe like King Herod, maybe you're having some issues because... You want the Lord to be in your life and you want him to be in control, but you're having a hard time letting go and you've got a death grip on that steering wheel because you want to be in the driver's seat and God keeps saying, just let me be in control and I'll show you how good I am and I'll show you how much I love you and I'll show you my faithfulness. Or maybe in this faith journey during this Christmas season, the Lord just simply wants to remind you that he sent his son to pay the price for your sins. And from before the beginning of time, he loved you before you were created. And we just have to be reminded this isn't just a baby in a manger. This isn't just a Christmas story that we talk about or show cartoons about and write movies about. This isn't a reason just to have Christmas and chocolate pie and days off of school and work. But this is life and eternity changing. That a baby The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God came to live and to die for you and for me. And that should change who we are and how we live.
there was a gift also to weigh. I came across this video a few weeks ago, and it's a man and a woman. I'm not sure if it's a husband and wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend. It could be a brother and sister. And they're out fishing on a boat, and she has caught a fish, or she has hooked it, and she's reeling it in, trying to get it in the boat. And then all of a sudden, the rod and reel, they fly out of her hand into the water, and then he has to make a decision about what he's going to do. And this is what happens. Not today. So he gets it. He jumps in, catches the rod and reel, and then he keeps on fighting until they get the fish. Okay? That's good. You can stop that. So nothing else happens there. But I don't know the reason. It's because maybe he paid like $3,000 for that rod and reel, and he's like, not today. That thing's coming back in the boat. Or maybe like they landed that once in a lifetime, you know, 60 foot marlin. He's like, we're catching this fish. Or maybe he wanted to impress or like, watch my diving skills. And he jumps in and he gets it. But whatever it was, he didn't have a long time. This was a decision that had to be made. I'm either jumping in the water or I'm staying here in the boat. It has to be one or the other. And I have to make a decision right now. And sometimes that's how we're faced with decisions. There's no time to think. It's not, hey, what am I going to wear to school tomorrow? It's not what we're going to eat for supper next week. It's not a decision that we can think about. It's not a big deal. This is an important life change decision that must be made immediately. And then other times we have days or we have weeks or we have months, and those decisions really weigh on us when they're important in our life. Something else that should weigh upon us is this third gift that the Magi brought. Verse 11. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, when my children were born, this may have been different for you, nobody showed up with bars of gold. Now, if you intended to and missed that moment, we will still gladly accept that gift. You can bring that bar of gold by any time. Gold was valuable then, gold is valuable now. Incense was something these people knew about. It was valuable. It could be traded. It could be sold. It could be burned as worship. Myrrh was inappropriate in every way you could ever imagine. So I think about the jokes about myrrh. I would say, what do we use myrrh for? Well, some people use myrrh as a word, and they say myrrh Christmas. Myrrh Christmas. Other people would say, well, myrrh is a spice. What's the secret to Granny's gumbo? A lot of black pepper, a whole bunch of filet, and some myrrh sticking in there. Myrrh in this day and time was used for embalming bodies. That's, that was its purpose. And so if you bring this into the world today, can you imagine somebody shows up at the hospital, your child is born, and they come in, they bring you some embalming fluid. You would say, what is wrong with you? You come home from the hospital and your baby is six months old. And somebody shows them and says, I'm so sorry, I didn't see the hospital. I've been in quarantine for six months. I just got out, but I wanted to bring you a gift. Here is some wood that is especially designed for building a casket for your child. No. They come and visit, and it's your child's first birthday. They say, I want to give them something really special. Here's a gift certificate for Finch's funeral home. Get out of my house. This is inappropriate and cold and dark. Why would you talk about death when my child is just barely starting to celebrate life? And so they bring this gift of myrrh, a symbol of death, because the gold reminds us he is the king, the incense reminds us he is God's own son, and this myrrh reminds us that he was going to go to a cross and that he was going to die. And so we think about the picture, and I think the beauty of Scripture shows us that this was all happening 2,000 years ago, and yet it means just as much for us today as it did then. And that God's painting this picture to remind you that he's not just a baby in a manger. This isn't just about songs that we sing one month out of the year. And so he's saying, this child, Jesus, grew up to be a Savior who went to a cross and died that you might have everlasting life. He fulfilled the prophecy. So it's no surprise. So since before the beginning of time, God loved you enough to have a plan to save your soul. Praise God. When I think about Christmas gifts, it's fun when you're a child to get a gift. 
It's even funner as parents to watch your children open up gifts. When I think to my childhood, what I would consider to be a not great gift, you know, a toothbrush, batteries, underwear, there's nothing fun about any of those things. Even as an adult, probably 15, 20 years ago, I had a lady give me a shadow box. It was handmade out of wood. It had a beautiful piece of glass on top, and inside were pine cones and sticks and all these beautiful leaves, and then there was also a dead bird inside. And I don't know if that bird was alive when she meant to give it to me and forgot, and he died in the box. I'm not sure if he was like a dried bird. I don't know, but it was a bird that had life, and now it was dead in a box, and she gave it to me. To me, that was not the greatest gift. But of course, I smiled. Oh, thank you so much for the dead bird in the box. It's wonderful. <laughs> when I was probably eight or nine years old, thinking back to the worst gifts, every Saturday before Christmas Day, we would spend in Livingston at my grandparents' house. And the whole family would come, all my aunts, uncles, all my cousins. And my, grandma, my grandpa, we called him Papa. He would fry fish for the whole family. So we'd have fried fish and hush puppies and french fries, and we'd eat all together. And they had a, an additional room on their home that would sit about 10 to 12 people, and we'd put about 40 people in that room. And we all smelled like grease from all the fried fish, and then we'd have all of our gifts, and we'd hand them out. And so my grandparents would often make gifts for the grandkids. So my grandma would either sew or crochet something. Papa would make us something out of wood. And so as a young child, that's not always the most exciting gift to receive. So I'd always get the talking to on the way to family Christmas saying, now listen, whatever you get when you open it up, you smile and say thank you. Even if it's a dead bird in a box, no matter what it is, you smile and you say thank you. Yes, I understand. So I'm probably eight or nine years old and I open up my box and inside is a homemade red crocheted sweater from my grandmother. And it had a huge sock monkey on the front of it. And so it looked, it looked very similar to this here. So I'm like eight or nine years old. First of all, I don't wear sweaters. I am a sweater. It's what I do. I sweat all the time. This was about four inches thick. There was a 0% chance I was ever going to wear this. And if I did, I would definitely get made fun of and probably get beat up by my cousins in the same room. So I'm looking at this going, this has got to be the worst thing I have ever gotten in my life. But of course, I'm smiling on. Oh, I love it. I've always wanted a four-inch thick red crochet sweater with a monkey on it. How did you know? And inside, I'm dying going, this is terrible. I'm never going to wear this. And in that moment, right, 30 years ago, it was the worst gift ever. And now, fast forward 30 years, and what I wouldn't give to be sitting back in that room with all those family members and with my grandma and grandpa who are now in heaven and open up a gift that they made for me with their own hands. Isn't it true that our perception of gifts changes from when we're children to when we're adults and then later in life? I don't know what the perception was of Mary and Joseph when they saw these three gifts for Jesus. But I know what they mean for us. They gave him gold because he was the king of the Jews. And they gave him incense because he was God's only son. And they brought him myrrh because he would die for the sins of the world. A baby boy, the fulfillment of the prophecy, the savior of the world, truly Jesus is the wonder of Christmas. Lord, today, this is what we pray in the power of your name. Lord, that these would not just be verses in a book that we read, but that these would be instructions, illuminations. These would be eye-opening words that tell us about what we need to know about who you are and who you should be in our lives. Gifts from the Magi, wise men, gold for the king. 
Lord, do we give you our very best or do we just give you what's left over? Do we treat you as the king of our lives? Or God, do we only reach out to you when we need something or when we've used up all of our resources and you are our last resort? Incense for the Son of God the Father, our Messiah. Lord, do we live our lives thankful for a king who would leave his throne to enter into this world only to be beaten, abused, abandoned, and to give up his life on a cross? Oh, how we are loved. Myrrh for a sacrificial Savior. Lord, what are the sacrifices that we make for our family, for our work, for our hobbies, for our friends, for our neighbors? Sacrifices that we make for all things that aren't bad, they're good. But Lord, how often we fall short in the sacrifices that we will make for you when you gave absolutely everything that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. Convict our hearts today. Had we have not been living with you as our king, had we have not been giving our best, had we have not been sacrificing, God, and show us what needs to change. Give us the strength, the courage, and the accountability to do that. Lord, New Year's is coming. It's known for making changes in our life, but help us not to wait a few more days. Help us to be changed in this moment right here and right now. Lord, this is what we pray in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together as we sing this invitation. Today we invite you to respond to however the Lord has spoken to you, whether it be just through singing or through praying where you're at, praying at this altar. If you want somebody to pray with you, I'll be loved, be glad to do so. I'm right here at the front. Please lead us, Pastor Glenn. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Speak. 
I told a few people this morning that this is my orange, you glad it's almost 2021 shirt. And so many people are just saying, I can't wait for this year to be over. And here's the truth. Just when it turns from December the 31st to January 1st, it's not going to give you unspeakable joy. Only Jesus can do that. So I pray in this next week, these days, and these months, no matter what 2021 comes, no matter what happens, that you have unspeakable joy. Because if Jesus is in your heart and he is the king of your life, then your circumstances, they won't matter. I'm so glad you were here with us today, joining us on campus or online. Hope you have a wonderful New Year's Eve celebration wherever you're at. Stay safe and stay uh, comfortable, and hope you have a great New Year's Day. Don't forget to eat your black-eyed peas and your green cabbage for good luck, and we'll see you again next Sunday.